I had an idea. Just a, it is a business idea for you. I know you don't have advertisers, but have you considered preemptive advertising? Say you have a sponsor. Pick a company that's having some issues, you know, like Twitter or somebody who just did layoffs. And what you do is you record it. And then you find somebody within the company, just send them an invoice. <laughs> see if they pay it. <laughs> Hopefully no one asked for the contract. I love it, Say, dude. Well, I, I, you know, I set this up with Jody. And, uh, oh, you know, that's so brilliant, dude. That is really funny. I have never... <laughs> Oh man, you know, I bet that works at some like really big companies where nobody knows anybody else. And they're just, oh, well, I guess like if sourcing approved. This, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Just a thought. Just a thought. Podcast uh, preemptive advertising. That's a brilliant idea. All right, dude, I'm going to read this thing and get into it. You ready? Yep. Let's do it. <clears throat> UX fam, how's your mom and them? Welcome to another episode of Beyond UX Design. I'm Jeremy. If you're new here, welcome to the show. I am super stoked to have you. And if you haven't done it already, please consider subscribing to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you are regular here and you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would really appreciate you leaving a five star review. That'll help me out so much more than you can imagine. This week's episode is brought to you by Figma Academy. Now, we usually talk soft skills here in the show. But let's not forget that hard skills are important too. Mastering tools like Figma can be crucial in today's job hunting landscape. Remember back in episode 49 with Tommy Joko, he mentioned knowledge debt and how you'll pay for learning either with your time or with your money. Well, if you don't have time to learn it on your own, Figma Academy is your fast track to mastering Figma and you'll be in good company. Over 4,000 designers from industry leaders like Shopify, Microsoft, and Amazon have already signed up. The course is hands-on, and you'll be part of a talented cohort of designers. Plus, they host live Q&A sessions every Thursday to clear up any questions that you might have. You want your company to foot the bill? Lots of designers have done just that, and Figma Academy even offers an expense template to make it a breeze to get approval from your boss. And because you're all awesome listeners, I've teamed up with Figma Academy to offer you all a $100 discount. Just head to figmaacademy.com and use the promo code BEYONDUX at checkout. That's BEYONDUX, all one word, at checkout. This week's audiobook recommendation is The Science of Self-Learning, How to Teach Yourself Anything, Learn More in Less Time, and Direct Your Own Education by Peter Hollins. The Science of Self-Learning is a guide to mastering self-education. It offers actionable strategies for setting goals, practicing effectively, and adjusting learning techniques over time. The book blends psychological insights and educational theories to empower readers to teach themselves anything, from new languages to professional skills, even UX design, much like our guest today. It's an excellent resource for anyone looking to take control of their own learning journey, making it particularly useful for career shifters and junior UX designers aiming to upskill independently. So head on over to beyondUXdesign.com slash audible trial to start your free trial and download the science of self-learning completely free and help support the show in the process. And as always, thanks so much to Chris, Sarah, Quan, Stacy, Radu, Megan, Andrew, John, Mark, and Kevin for all their support. And if you want to join those fine folks and help keep the show independent and ad-free, you can become a patron for as little as $3 a month. That's less than a dollar an episode. And if you do that, you'll get some sweet, sweet perks for your support. And of course, if you think the show is worth sharing, then I would love it if you told some friends. So I've got a guest today that I found another guest from LinkedIn. I don't know what it is. I find like all of my guests on LinkedIn. It's a great place to find really smart people. Uh, Kevin and I, I, Kevin, how did we get connected? Do you even remember? Uh, I think it was probably in uh, connection with one of the podcasts that you did about boot camps with Andrew. Oh, that's what it was. Okay, yeah. so Kevin, Kevin's pretty passionate about this, and this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm really excited. Kevin and I were going to talk about his journey into UX, self-taught, non-traditional route to architecture. Really fascinating story. We're going to talk about that today. Kevin Schertz is a recent career switcher to UX design from an extensive background as a registered architect in the construction industry from his childhood days of writing a missile command clone in basic and continuing as a content developer at a CAD software company prior to becoming a licensed architect. He's always loved the intersection of architecture, product design, and technology. 
So Kevin, welcome to Beyond UX Design. I am so excited to talk to you today. How's it going? It's going great, Jeremy. Thank you for having me on. I'm very, very grateful for this. Absolutely, man. So one of the things that I've just been fascinated about was your journey. And we, you and I, as we mentioned before, we got connected. We were talking about boot camps. And I had a couple episodes where we talked about boot camps. And you had some comments and, and some insight that I thought were, were fascinating. One of the things that I found most fascinating about you was this idea of just your, your self your self-starter philosophy. And when I, we, you and I had a chance to catch up a couple of weeks back and you talked about your non-traditional route to architecture. And you're actually taking that sort of approach again to learning UX design. And I think a lot of people out there can actually learn quite a bit from what you're doing, how you're doing it and your experience. So I'm really excited to talk to you about that today. So before we get into that, though, tell me a little bit about your backstory. I would love to know uh, all about how you you got into architecture and then ultimately what led to UX design. Well, I grew up in Maryland, started with computers early on in life. I was probably, you know, 12, 13 or so when I got my first computer. And uh, like I said in the intro, really started getting into programming and stuff, enjoyed making games, things like that within the constraints of what computers could do back then. Also grew up with a real interest in drawing, uh, art, design, so forth. Um, went to college, went to an art and design school, uh, finished up there, uh, and then uh, went into architecture. My degree is actually in interior and environmental design. So it's not a, it's not a oh, traditional wow, okay. architecture degree, uh, but it did give me the skills to be able to go and work at an architect's office. One of my, one of my uh, teachers, uh, his name is Scott Payton. Uh, referred me to my first job. Uh, it was another architecture firm in the city where my school was located. Carol Hickey was the architect who uh, who brought me on. And, uh, and so that's how I started into my journey through architecture. And that continued along until I had the opportunity to work at a, at a, a software company, a product called Vectorworks, and became a, a feature designer uh, of uh, software for architects as CAD software product. Oh, okay. It was, so this was this great combination of being able to have an interest in computers with some subject matter expertise in architecture and able, right, to, right. able to bring that along. From there, I had an opportunity uh, to join uh, the American Institute of Architects as a staff member. They had a subject matter uh, expertise section called uh, Technology and Architectural Practice. And this seemed like another great opportunity, you know, to be able to yeah. leverage on behalf of the profession, talk, you know, be able to provide resources to members uh, about, about you in implementing technology into their practice. It was during this time that I learned that the architectural experience I was gaining, I was getting closer and closer to actually being, being able to get my architect's license. Now, this is one of the reasons why I took some of these detours was because I went to the CAD software company because I love technology, but I also didn't realize that the path to becoming a licensed architect was available to me. What I learned through my time at the American Institute of Architects was there were states that did allow you to uh, qualify to sit for the exams with a certain level of work experience. Didn't necessarily need that specialized degree for it to happen. And fortunately, Maryland is one of the states where that was the case. Oh, okay. But what that was going to require was for me to go back into architecture to complete my hours before I could sit for the exam. So that's what I did. I uh, went back out, got some additional years of work experience. Ultimately, was able to uh, sit for the exams, passed all the exams, became a registered architect. Can you compare that path to licensed architect from what most people do? Because that's sort of fascinating. You took that sort of roundabout approach and not necessarily self-taught because you had, you know, you had a university degree and things like that, but it was sort of non-traditional. What else, what did you have to do that was different from what someone who got an architecture degree would do? Uh, well, in the state of Maryland, it was really a difference between how many years of work experience you required. You could substitute in lieu of having a first professional degree, which is, you know, a five-year architect's degree. Um, you could augment your experience, your degree, and substitute in additional work experience. So that oh, was okay. that was what it was. And you know, I just kind of fell back. You know, it's it's one of those things that when I when I went to to college, I was young and dumb, 
And I actually <laughs> thought, as most are, yeah. Well, here's I didn't mention this before, but when I actually went to uh, art and design school, my initial uh, thought was to uh, get into commercial art. Okay. Wanted to be a commercial artist because. You know, I had this, you know, young and dumb idea that, you know, it was going to all be like, you know, the show Mad Men, where I would, yeah, you know, I'd put together entire <laughs> branding of things and, oh, you know, yeah, be able to show those and, and everything. Well, obviously it didn't work that way. Uh, it was more about, uh, you know, back then it was, it was uh, much more, uh, things were still in the infancy of desktop publishing. Mm. And, and so, you know, there was still drawing by hand, you know, font hand lettering fonts and things like yeah, that. And yeah. I was just like, nope, this is not at all what's for me. <laughs> so the school also had a program in interior and environmental design. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And I really found that I had an aptitude for that and an interest in that. And so that was the path that I took. So, you know, the reason why uh, I, it's in, in many ways, I got to tell you, things have just worked out as they have. Um, I'd love to say I had a master plan for all these things, but that is not at all the case in my life. Yeah. So well, let me ask you this, because I, I actually had a really great conversation with uh, an architect turned UX designer a couple of weeks back. Now, she was in Europe. She's in actually Norway now. She was originally in Poland, moved to Norway. Um, but she was working with more construction companies as an architect. And it was funny because we were talking about sort of similarities and comparing and contrasting architecture and UX design and, you know, UX design, obviously very human centered. And then one of the things I was thinking in my head, cause I'm not an architect, so I'm just kind of making assumptions, but you're designing for a human, but in a physical space and her, her, uh, you know, reply back was, you know, it's funny because working with these contractors, I didn't talk to humans at all, but she said, one of the, one of the people who tends, who tend to talk to in, uh, people more in their work is interior designers. And those, those environmental designers like you're talking about. So I'm curious from that sense, having that background, was that sort of how you ended up sort of making a connection between architecture and UX because you did more of that human centered design in the physical space as an interior designer? I think so. I mean, really it was, it was not so much interior design as it was doing residential design. A lot of my career has been residential design focused, which ironically, a lot of jurisdictions, you don't need to have an architect's license to be able to oh, complete okay. the design for a residential project. So it really becomes important about people coming to you for your expertise to help them with their project. The value has to be seen. But the thing is, in contrast to things like a commercial project or a municipal project, obviously people are very passionate about, about where they want to live. Um, you know, a residence is for many people, the largest investment they're going to make in their lives. And so yeah, yeah. what happens through the design process is that you, you get to know people very, very well. I mean, you become, you know, you become a designer uh, sometimes you become a marriage counselor. There's a lot of, there's a lot of <laughs> yeah, aspects I because in some, well, one of the things that I learned over time was that the process that you go through for design of someone in a residence, you're asking questions that maybe people have not considered of themselves about the ways that they live. And it also can, it, it can also reveal, uh, places in which, uh, the, the people who are, um, are to, are going to live there may have entirely different ideas about what they uh, what they want out of the the finished design. Like for example, think about something like a bathroom design. You know, master bathroom. There is a whole range of ways that people uh, want that to be set up, and you know, it could be something where somebody says, "I want to have my own shower. I want to have my own this, my own that." And that could, those can be things where people have never had that conversation with each other before in their lives. That's fascinating. I had never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. You're navigating this, you're facilitating this. And, you know, above all else, you have to advocate for what you believe is in their best interest as far as being able to uh, steer things back in when maybe necessary. Could be a thing where I understand that you want this, but that is not going to be within your budget. You know, all these sorts of things, being, <laughs> be, being the advocate on part of the client and also being able to just bring that wealth of experience to their to their project. When you explain it like that, it does kind of make me, uh, I, I just see, I mean, I'm, they're obviously not the same, but 
I see so many connections between how we approach user-centered design and, you know, I don't know what you might call that. Is there a term for that in, in the architecture industry, human-centered design or human-centered type of architecture or something? Is there, is there some thing like that? And it's kind of fascinating. Honestly, not that I'm, not that I can pull out of my head at this moment. I'm sure there is one. And I know, I'm sure that somebody is screaming at me right now who's listening to this, <laughs> but, but it is, I mean, it's just, it's just the process of design. I mean, it's, uh, you know, because, and because you're, um, because everything that's done in architecture, uh, is in the context of physical space, you know, people are constantly encountering what you're doing. You know, in in a house, it's, you know, what is the, you know, some of the things that come up is, you know, as far as the approach to the property, you know, how is it sited on the land to take advantage of the sun and views and things like that. So everything about architecture is a continuous experience of people with their environment. That's true. I, I could just imagine I used to live in this old house and we, I would always curse whoever designed this house because the way the door opened and it would always hit this other door and the knobs would hit each other because they opened and, you know, and it would just like, who did this and why, you know, why would right. they just open in this different direction? Anyway, and I just imagine, <laughs> I just imagine somebody, you know, having that in your head as you're designing this, like, are people going to be cursing me for the next 50 years or a hundred years or something like that? Cause these doors don't open the right way. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of fascinating. One of the things I'm kind of curious about, I know we're, we're, we're not necessarily talking about UX design, but I'm curious about this. Uh, As someone who has been building residential homes and things like that, are there, is there something similar to a persona or an an archetype maybe when you see, you know, people come in and you're like, oh, they're going to be this kind of person or, oh, that person's definitely going to want this, you know. Um, they're going to want the gold, everything and the diamonds and the sparkly things. Um, is there an art, is that, is that something in this industry that's very standard, that's similar to what we might call a persona or an archetype in UX design? Well, there would be in the context of maybe a commercial project or a, um, a municipal project in the sense that it's not, I'm not in many instances, especially with those fields, especially for speculative projects, you're not encountering, uh, the, the, the final user of the space. Think about yeah, something, right. um, think about something like an investment, a construction, like a, uh, a strip mall, you know, which is very common in the United States. And there might be, uh, a series of different businesses that are going to occupy that space. Now the developer is going to have to make some reckons as far as who is going to be, uh, going into one of those spaces might be a hair salon, might be a nail salon, might be you know, back in the day, it would have been a video store, you know, things like this, you know, maybe a GameStop, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a chain store or something like that. So there has to be some sort of interpretation about the way that that's going to be used. Although you do not know who the end user is necessarily going to be. That would be more of an instance where you would, you would have a persona, but, but in, in residential work, it's, it's really about, you know, you, you meet people where they are and I've had an entire, just a, uh, the whole range of clients along the way from everything of people just saying, I just need you to draw me up some plans to people who say, can you design the cabinetry for me? It's, it's really just a matter of applying, uh, applying your, your experience to, to every project. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully every, every client comes away, uh, happy and, and, uh, feels very good about their, their experience so that they'll refer you to the next one. (laughs) That's the important part. I'm curious, getting into UX design, um, what, what was it about the UX design that drew you to it and what made you make that final decision to, to, you know, leave architecture, become, become UX designer and ultimately, you know, your journey into UX design. Tell us a little bit more about, about that. Sure. Well, the appeal for me, I mean, what I've, what I've realized is that UX design has been something that I've always been interested in. And I'll take that back to, you know, when I was a young kid and I was making the games and things like that. I mean, these were all getting into how is this going to work? What's it going to look like? What is my, uh, uh, background as far as, you know, what kind of, what kind of games do I like? What am I, what's going to be my inspiration to this? So it's something where I felt like I've always had an interest in that. I just didn't know that's what it was called. You know, I mean, that's, right. that's the thing is, you know, I didn't know, <laughs> yeah. didn't know what UX design was called. 
What brought me into it specifically was, I'll tell you what, the pandemic in particular really took a toll on me and just uh, kind of, I think, accelerated uh, my burnout in architecture. Um, the, the pandemic really disrupted the supply chain, uh, made doing projects very difficult. And I just realized that I, I really, I was, I did not have the energy level to be able to sustain being a practicing architect. Now, this coincides with, and you mentioned it in the intro, coincides with the, um, the expansion of technologies like AR and VR uh, into, into, the, into the workplace, into the, into the profession as a whole. So it seemed as though right now is a good time to be able to leverage my skills that I've, that I've acquired through architecture into the UX space because how people are experiencing their technology were intertwined with the physical space. Yeah, and with with especially with AR too, with augmented reality, um, you know, some of the stuff that like we're doing at our where I work, you know, I I struggle sometimes to see the utility in a a thirty five hundred dollar set of goggles for a commercial uh, application, right? Where I'm just walking around and I need a map or something. But for where I work, it's all enterprise, industrial type stuff, manufacturing, inspection, repair of jet engines, and things like that. That augmented reality piece comes in real handy when I can just look at a thing and it can highlight something or pull up instructions and, you know, pull up a defect using using AI and actually highlight it using augmented reality while I'm actually looking at the part. You know, these are these are really fascinating things that, you know, our team isn't necessarily building today, but these are things that they're thinking about, like investing in in the future. And I agree. I, it's like fascinating stuff, you know, and I say that there's no commercial application. I, I, that's me not really understanding the space. I'm sure there's other people who would have, you know, really interesting use cases for things like that, but, but that's fascinating. Yeah. So that got you really excited about, about this. And that was sort of the impetus to kind of get into UX design. Absolutely. And I could see, you know, in, in architecture and construction, um, there's a very strong business case there Yeah. to be able to have a client come in and put on a set, a head, uh, you know, a headset, and be able to oh, yeah. experience a space, a speculative space, you know, if you're yeah, looking to wow, get good yeah. buy-in uh, from a client. And as far as the price goes on these things, you know, if you're talking about projects of a particular scale, those yeah. that's just pennies, that's pennies nothing, on the yeah. dollar <laughs> relative to <laughs> yeah, the cost sure. because it is always cheaper to make changes before construction than during. Oh, yeah. That's one big difference with the UX design for from architecture, for sure. Yeah, you can't iterate on a building <laughs> after Absolutely. you start, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's just change. Yeah. <laughs> we need to change the layout of this basement. You've already got three or four floors built. So tell me a little bit about that actual journey into UX design. So that was sort of the impetus to get there. What, how'd that, what did that journey look like for you? Uh, I know you went to a boot camp. Talk to me a little bit about you know, your decision to do the boot camp versus maybe a traditional school or, um, you know, which, how you chose the boot camp and things like that. I'd love to, to hear kind of your thought process there. Sure. Well, I went to Design Lab. Uh, I am, uh, as of the time we record this, I've submitted my portfolio for final evaluation, but haven't, oh, received, yeah. haven't received word back yet on that. So, um, so that's where I'm at and I'm, you know, currently working, looking for work. Uh, I went to Design Lab. They had two, uh, two programs. First one's called Foundations, which is kind of a, a kind of a starter, uh, kind of dip your toe in before you're going to, going to invest in their full, uh, academy program. The reason why I chose that as I did my research was that I really liked that the program had a combination of coursework, but then also mentorship and group mm, crits yeah. were a strong component of their, of their program. I knew I knew that I needed to to have mentors in in my in my journey, and the fact that it was structured within the school uh, curriculum was important to me. The reason why I chose to go to a boot camp specifically was because I knew that. Well, first of all, uh, I could I wasn't going to be able to come home to my wife and say, "Honey, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to watch YouTube videos for six months." That wasn't going to be on the table yeah, as an true, option. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, self learning was really that self-learning was not um, necessarily going to be my best my best uh, uh, path. Uh, one of the things that I did like about a boot camp was 
I think that this established curriculum shows a, a fact that, that you're willing to commit to a goal and you're willing to do so within a, within a constraint, within a structure. You're also financially willing to invest in your future. Um, I also like the fact that I knew I was going to be able to uh, uh, have, a, have a group of mentors that was going to be established with me. And then I'd also have a cohort of other students that I could connect with while I was going through all this. Self-learning, there is nothing wrong with it whatsoever. It just wasn't, I felt, the way that I was going to be able to get the most out of the experience of preparation for the industry. So the boot camp. So how did you decide? You mentioned that uh, Design Lab had the mentorship uh, platform built in. Uh, was this just one of the few that you found that did that, um, or did you, you know, knew somebody who went there, or you s- had some experience with it? Or I just did online research. Um, that's all I did. I didn't know anybody who had been to a boot camp before. I just I did online research about this. There were there's a lot of sites out there where there'll be reviews of of the various programs from former students. Uh, tried to find what what the central themes were. Tried to see what their schedules were. Um, cost was not as much of a concern for me. Uh, I knew it was. I knew I was going to be spending, you know, seven to eight thousand dollars at a minimum. Uh, it, but it, but you know, so it was a combination of things. But really, it was about how did they seem to have a structure for the for the program, and then also what were the online reviews? What was the feedback from people that had gone there? Have have they gotten jobs? Things like that, I assume, were were, were kind of things that you were looking at as well. Yeah, jobs would definitely be a component of it, but it was really more about the. It was really mostly about what was the what was the learning experience. Um, I know that there are boot camps that have job guarantees and things like that. At Design Lab has that too. You know, read the fine print, obviously, on all those all those things. But but it was really about the learning experience. The job job will take care of itself. Assuming you did the learning experience. I mean, it's, it's one of those things <laughs> yeah, where, yeah. you know, it's, I've got fallback positions, you know? Yeah, for sure. So I'm curious about this because this is something that, that I, and one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk to you was, you know, your experience with architecture, going the non-traditional route, learning on the job, a lot of that stuff. And quick recap to there, you mentioned that, you know, you have to, you have to spend more time working in a, in a, in an, in an, in an office to make up for the amount of coursework you didn't end up taking. And I assume that meant, you know, that's because you're learning on the job is the assumption I'm, I'm learning as I'm doing. There's still a test that you have to take and stuff, right? So, so it's all about learning on the job. And, and to me, what that implies is it's a lot of teaching yourself these things. You know, it's not like you're, you're just magically picking it up. It's, it's, you've got to do it. You've got to practice. You've got to learn it. And I, I wanted to talk to you about taking that mindset and applying that to the boot camp because I've heard so many different things from different people from all over the spectrum. You know, I'd got nothing out of this boot camp to I got so much out of this boot camp and everything in between. And one of the things that I'm kind of taking away with a lot of these conversations that I'm having with people is you really get out of it what you put into it. Right. And if you don't do the work, <laughs> you're not going to get anything out of it. So I would love to know a little bit about your, your maybe your process for absorbing as much as you can in, you know, and, and is design lab more hands-on or is it more self-paced kind of a thing? Cause there are both boot camps that do both. It is self-paced to a point you are expected. If you're going to commit to either a, a part-time or a full-time track that you're going to be submitting work to your mentor, uh, at a, at a particular pace. Now they do, you know, I, I completed later than I was originally scheduled to, uh, you know, things happen, but, but it is something where you are expected to submit information. One of the things in my, in my architecture background is that to be able to sit for the exam, I had to, uh, have a, I, w- I was working basically as an intern to someone, to a supervisor who was then, uh, confirming my hours. It's not a self-report situation. You have to have right. someone, a registered architect, who is signing off on what you're doing and making sure you're hitting all the subject matter portions that you need to before you qualify. So uh, as far as learning goes, there's always been an element of mentorship involved in my, in my life, in my professional career. 
So again, that mentorship component of the boot camp was of great value to me. But but you you hit it the nail on the head. I mean, you get out of it what you put into it. You have to. I I have found that you know coming in with uh with the mindset that it's going to be a lot of work. You're going to be you're going to have to spend more time, more hours than probably what the coursework is saying it's going to be. You have to be your best advocate for your education. And that can include things like mentorship. One of the things that my boot camp um, allowed is, you know, maybe a mentor wasn't going to be a good fit for you. And you could and you could request a new mentor. There was also a point in the curriculum between phases where you could start with a mentor on one part and then and then change mentors for the second part. So I did have situation where um, I was paired with someone and it just wasn't a good click. I mean, very nice person, not at all a, a, a question of what I believe their competence to be. It's just that my learning style was different than their teaching style. So I requested a change and, and that Fair, was, yeah. and as it turned out, um, my, my mentor for, uh, the, for the academy portion of my my work, uh, Chrissy, it was just absolutely amazing to work with. I could I could not have asked for a better experience. That's awesome. But it also required me to push through that and say, "This isn't working. I need to make a change." And of course, that's awkward, you know, because you don't want to feel like you're, you know, rejecting someone. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but you have to realize, hey, I'm paying money for this, and I want to yeah, get as much true. out of this as I want. So. Yeah. It's that advocacy for your own education that's an important, important thing. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm curious to this, you know, having, especially being self-taught, this is sort of obvious that you only get what you put into a self, especially with, um, you know, a, a self-paced rather, uh, where, where I'm, I assume there were recordings and you watch them and then you had some coursework and, and, and that kind of thing. It wasn't an instructor leading a, a class every single time, I assume, right? Yes, that's correct. So in this case, I, I'm just curious, like, what was your method there? Like, did you have some way that you took this work, you went back, you, you, you watched the video. It's more than just that though, obviously, right? It's applying it. It's all those things. Was there a method that you used to take that and, and sort of get the most out of it that you could maybe give advice to somebody who's go, might be going through that and say, this is what I did. It worked really well for me. Obviously, you know, take your grain of salt, might not work for everybody, but I'm just curious, what was your method for doing that? Well, I was a full-time student, so I had to treat it as a full-time job. Which meant ah, I okay. had to I had to get up every morning, have my breakfast, um, do if I was going to go, you know, say to the gym or something, do that. But then it's sit down and do the work because when it comes right down to it, when you're in when you're out there in the workplace, it's the same thing. I mean, yes, there'll be moments where you want to get up and walk away because you need to clear your head or get rip, get through a creative block or something, but. It was a matter of really adopting the philosophy of this is now my job. Ah, yeah, yeah, full time. Being right. a student is my job. I love that. Yeah, and and that's something that I feel like you know it, it's it's definitely difficult with part time learners in general. Even if you go to a, a traditional school and you have a full time job and you're taking night classes, um, that's so that's super difficult. I did that for a while actually. I was working during the day and went to classes at night. And it's really hard to, to find the time and you get sidetracked and then you miss stuff. And, you know, being able to, to focus on that full time, you know, certainly that's a privilege. Not everybody can do that. But if you can, I think that's a really critical aspect is treating it, you know, treating your, your schoolwork as a full time job, if you can afford it. I think that's a huge takeaway. Absolutely. Absolutely. I did do my foundations. I did do as a part time. Uh, class while I was still working for the architecture firm I was with, so I did have that experience as well as trying to do uh, trying to do part time at night and then do full time during the day, and it is exhausting. It's a it, it is a lot, and I just realized that now full time is the only way I'm going to be able to do this because my work was going to suffer, and that was the thing that was important to me was that I couldn't allow for my part time studies to to uh, take me away from the, the, the level of work that was expected of me at my full-time job. That's a great point, you know, cause it's, it's not about, it's not just about not getting the most out of your current, you know, or it's not, it's not about, uh, just about getting the most out of the, the schooling. It's about, it's a, there's an opportunity cost there, obviously. Right. So what are you sacrificing in the, the other part of your life? You know, 
Um, and that's something, you know, I, so certainly some jobs are different than others for sure. But uh, that's a really great point, especially when like a knowledge worker type of a job with architecture versus showing up and doing retail. You know, it's very a little bit different where you're, you know, working, you're only working when you're there versus something like a thought thought worker where you're, you're a knowledge worker where you're kind of working wherever you are. So I'm curious with, with regards to uh, learning on your own and this mentorship model. There's a lot of people out there that think of mentorship as, you know, I go to ADP list and I, I sign up for a 30 minute meeting with somebody. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about your concept of mentorship and, and compare that and contrast that with some of these mentor platforms. I, I talked with Steven Steiner not long ago about, you know, speed dating almost with ADP list and how, you know, it's a great platform, but if you don't use it right, you're not going to get much out of it. So I'm curious from your perspective, what was your approach to mentorship? Did you stick with your mentor that you were assigned uh, through for the through the through your school, uh, or did you also supplement that with you know mentorship or you know quote unquote mentorship? We'll call it, I guess, outside of that, you know, talking with other people about various things. I'm just curious what your approach was there. Sure. Um, as far as mentors go, I did uh, right before I was to start boot camps. I did go on ADP list and my. My approach to looking for mentors was, uh, were they people who uh, were working in the industry in companies I would have an interest in or subject matters that I had an interest in, uh, being able to narrow things down? There are some people I spoke with at the beginning who I haven't, uh, haven't spoken with uh, uh, since. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's on me in the sense of I didn't keep touch with some people with it. But at the same time, I felt it was important to not, not waste people's time. I do know that there are people that, you know, it's, it's a matter of if you're going to go on ADP list, I personally was not comfortable with the idea of I'm going to contact these 10 people, you know, because it is an emotional investment in people and it, it is, is yeah. important. It, it's important to establish, I mean, and again, like mentorship in boot camp. People won't necessarily click just because somebody works at a company where you want to learn more about it, you know. So it's important to just kind of find find your tribe, you know, find the people who you really connect with and and learn more about what they do. I mean, that was that and that was something that was very important for me was to just get to know people and not not be like, hey, can you get me a job there? Um, I don't right. think that that's, you know, it's not <laughs> ADP list is not a make a wish foundation, you know, that's no. <laughs> I, and so I, I really, I really would encourage anybody who's listening to this to kind of consider what your priorities are in a mentor and, and understand that people are giving their time. They're not being paid for this. So be, be respectful of that. And also don't make the relationship something that's transactional you know, where you're just there to try to get something from somebody. And I've been able to, to create some great, great friendships with people that are ongoing. Um, and I, I, I love finding out about the people's lives, you know, what it's like yeah. on a day to day, what it's like on a day to day basis within their job, yeah. what they got going on outside of work and everything and finding those connections. Uh, and that's, that's what, for me anyway, that's what mentorship is about. It's about finding those common connections. And I've been fortunate enough to be a mentor for people in other aspects of life, professional and personal. And it is something where there's a lot to be gained from the mentor relationship as a mentor. So I it agree. needs to be something that works both ways. And if everyone's feeling like they're getting something out of the, the, uh, the, the relationship, there's no downside to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you mentioned that too, it's about getting to know them personally. And, and that's the thing too, that I, I, I struggle with, with something like ADP list. It isn't, it isn't the platform. It's not the people who run it necessarily. It's, it's a lot, it's how a lot of people end up using it. You know, it's, it's similar to boot camps. It's, it's not the boot camps themselves all the time. It's a lot of, it's how people expect something from it, you know, and they don't put in the work. And it's same, same with something like ADP list, you put in the work and, and you get what you get something out of it. Right. And I, I think one thing that you mentioned that I just want to highlight is this idea that you're getting to know them. That's really, that's really the, the point of it is getting to know them. You, it's very hard for someone to give you advice, meaningful advice, contextual advice, or advice that, that is, uh, you know, context uh, specific to your specific context. 
if they don't actually know you, <laughs> you know, so that like meeting someone for 30 minutes and expecting some solid advice is going to help you in some way is probably not very realistic. You know, you've got to get to know these people inside and outside of work, you know, or outside of their, their own, you know, professional work as well. I love that you mentioned that getting to know them outside of this. What do you just do for fun though? That's kind of the kind of thing that I, I think is, is a meaningful relationship, regardless of what you call it. You know, and sure, you could talk about UX stuff, but you'd also probably have other other things, other things in common that you could talk about. It's just a, re- a relationship in general, you know. Absolutely, it's funny because a couple of weeks back, somebody somebody was mentioning something on LinkedIn about having mentors, like quote unquote mentors, and it's like you know, I people I would consider mentors. I don't know that I've ever actually called them a mentor. <laughs> it's just they're friends, you know. They're people that I know that I work with, and they'd probably be weirded out if I call if they knew I referred to them as a mentor. So, you know, that idea of a mentor mentee relationship, it doesn't have to be an official thing either. I think that's the roundabout way. Finally, getting back to this point, it's just a relationship with people who have more experience in a certain area than you. And you're trying to talk with them and get advice and things like that. And I love that you're approaching it that way. I think you mentioned find your tribe. That's that's a beautiful thing. You know, it's like you don't have to have just one mentor either. It could be multiple people. It could be a group of people that you all kind of chat together, a group chat or Slack or something. It doesn't always have to be a one-on-one kind of 30-minute call from ADP list. Um, you know, it's a great place to meet people for sure. But just, again, you get out what you put in. Take it past there. Take it offline and uh, LinkedIn or social media. Get a coffee in real life if they're in the same city. You know, I think that's a, a beautiful thing that you're you started to do. I just I love that you did that. So let's see. All right. So thinking about where you're at today, right? You're 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 looking for work. You're finishing the the, the school up, and you've been doing this for what a year or two years now? A year now. Uh, I started back in uh, back in October. Of twenty two. Okay, so so you can wave a magic wand, you go back in time, and you meet Kevin from October twenty twenty two. What's some advice that you would give yourself a year ago, just starting out, knowing what you know now, that you might have maybe done differently, or maybe say, "Hey, keep doing that because it was really good." Sure. Well, the the first point that I'd make is that a um, for a career switcher, um, you've already. Uh, you've already taken a uh, a leap of faith if you're deciding to do this. Somebody told me something once, and it really just resonated with me. They said, fear has killed more dreams than failure ever has. And you've already conquered, you've already conquered some fear by making the choice to make a career switch. So don't push through it, you know, push through that, that fear. Uh, another thing I heard somebody say, and I'm sorry, I'm I'm full of cliches, man. I'm just a but but no, they it's said all good. <laughs> they uh, what they're they, great though. They work. <laughs> an- another thing that I heard somebody say was that fear is a mile wide and a mile high, but it's only paper thin, and you just got to push through mm, it. And I found that to be it. true in that, my yeah. life as well. So there's the other thing that I think I would. I would encourage people to do in addition to what we've talked about already, as far as being your own best advocate be for your interests is that you, you are going to, in your journey, read and hear a lot of people, uh, who are going to want to doubt your, your abilities or doubt your, or speculate on what you're capable of because of the path that you've taken. Don't let them win. Uh, you br- you're bringing oh, so much to the table through your life experience, and it's important to leverage that. It's important to celebrate that. It's important to highlight that. Don't burn bridges with whatever you've done in the past. Um, I, I am actually going to be probably ending up doing some consulting work for the architecture firm that I left. Had I had left on bad terms with them. That wouldn't have been an option for me, but it is. And that helps me with my job search. It gives me a little bit more financial security. Don't be afraid to ask for help. This is something where that is in the times in my, ah, in my professional career when I have stumbled. It's because I was unwilling to ask for help when I should have. So whether that be help from a mentor, help from a, from a colleague, from, a, from a st- another student, you know, help from your your significant other, whatever it may be, but don't be, don't consider your, the times in which you're getting to yeah. need help as some sort of personal failing because it's not. Yeah. And that, that one is, is actually really good too. I think that's important because a lot of people, especially career transitioners, right? They've, they've worked in 
professionally for some amount of time. They feel like they're established and now they're shifting to a completely new career and almost starting over as juniors. And I imagine that there's a lot of self-doubt there. Like if I asked for help, what's it going to look like? Like, you know, uh, I made this switch and people told me not to do it. And now I'm asking for help because I, I couldn't do it on my own. I think that's something a lot of people are probably struggling with, especially career shifters. I don't know. Maybe I'm assuming there, but, but that's a huge one. You know, don't be afraid to ask for help. You're starting out as a junior designer now, even if you have 10, 20 years of professional experience, there's nothing wrong with asking for help, especially with, with, you know, when, when you're starting a new field, you don't know what you don't know. You know, it's never a bad thing to ask for help regardless of where you're at in your career. Even if you're 20 years into UX design, ask for help, you know? Um, that's just maybe good advice in general. Just don't be afraid to ask for help. And there's, you know, don't, maybe one other thing I might add to that is don't assume people aren't willing to help because there's probably a lot of people out there that would be Absolutely. happy to help you. You just need to ask. Absolutely. Absolutely. That has been my experience is that uh, people, uh, I have been, I have been blown away by how generous and how giving of time people in the UX industry have been. Yeah. Um, it yeah. is something where, because it is a profession of lifelong learning, where things are always evolving, there's new insights to be gained. Uh, it's, it is definitely not something where you can stand still and expect yeah, and expect sure. to thrive. You know, we are, we are where we are in the industry. You know, the boot camps exist. They're out there. They're bringing out graduates. The industry has to accept that. And it's a matter of how, how does the industry elevate professionals? You know, if we want to, if we feel is that there are deficiencies in the, in the education that people are getting, help those people out. I, I totally agree there. And, and unfortunately I am, I'm not a manager. I'm not a, you know, director. It's really hard for me to just wave a magic wand right. and hire people. But there's something to be said there. And I feel very strongly that there has, and this is one thing that I, I sort of lament about, you know, compare the difference between architecture, law, medicine, you know, these established practices. There's a, there's a new talent pipeline. There's a method. There's a, a, a way. There's a, a, an assembly line for how you get from beginning to end you know, and how you get into that field. And unfortunately with UX, there is none of that. Yeah. And, you know, we always want to hire senior designers or junior designers with five years of experience, yeah. you know, clearly those are not junior designers anymore. You know, they're, they're certainly not entry level at least. And so, you know, that is something that we have got to figure out. You've got to figure out, you know, how, and it's a, it's an investment. That's the problem. It takes a lot of money and time because when you hire somebody, I was actually listening to uh, an interview with Darren Hood and Megan Thomas a couple weeks ago or a week ago. And they brought this up that, you know, like I'm, I'm actually paying you a salary, eight, let's say 80,000, hundred thousand, whatever it is. I don't think you're worth that yet. Right. Like my assumption is you're going to be worth that a year from now as a junior, right. Or as an entry level. So I'm not paying you with your words now. I'm paying you what I want you to be worth, which means I'm investing time and effort in you to get to where I want you to be a year from now. And that's an active thing that hiring managers and teams have got to figure out because I can't take an entry-level person from a boot camp and throw them into a project on their own, right? I've got to have a senior or somebody higher that can show them the ropes, teach them. Even if they know exactly what they're doing, I still probably want to teach them how, how I do it, how we do it, you know, my, our own processes, right? And I mean, this is not just boot camps. This is the same for a four-year degree as well. Like you're probably going to want to have somebody come in. I mean, just like with architecture, just like with doctors and, and lawyers, they're not going and, and operating brain surgery their first day out of school, right? They've got residencies and all these other things. And there is no apprenticeship program, unfortunately, or established apprenticeship program in UX. And so, you know, Absolutely. you're learning on the job. Yes, you're done with your school, but you still got a lot left to learn. And Absolutely. We're, we're not, unfortunately, as, a, as an industry, we're not willing to teach Right. We expect them to do as soon as we hire them. Yeah. It's a, I mean, and, and it, I do believe it's a two way street. I mean, I have heard many people say, uh, now that I'm uh, finishing up my boot camp, you know, just get out there, get that first job. And then a year from now or something, move up, move on, things like that. And I just, philosophically have issues with that for myself anyway. That may be okay for some others. Uh, Perhaps if I were in my young 20s or something like that, I could feel like I could do that and get away with my with my uh, with with that approach. But at this point in my career, 
I really wanted to, you know, come out and, and be in a, be with a company that I can then stay and grow with. That's, and that's something that I think becomes part of the equation for hiring managers is what happens is you bring in a person, you invest all that time with them and then they move on. And so you never see that value. So I do think that people who are graduates, especially at boot camps, need to understand just in the same way that a mentorship relationship should not be transactional. Uh, an, a job should not be necessarily taken the same way. Now, obviously, if you get into a job and it's a toxic environment or, so, or you're miserable right, or things right, like right. that, there's always exceptions to it. But I do believe that it is a two-way street, that by taking on a position, there has to be some level of commitment on behalf of the employee to the relationship that they're going to learn it. I'm 41, so maybe this is just my age coming out here. But, you know, I, I see a lot of people coming out of boot camps that just feel, or not boot camps, just younger people in general. Maybe I'm generalizing here. Like they just expect things. And it's like, that's not how life works, man. You got to get out there, bust your ass for a little bit, earn it. Um, yeah. Now, obviously, there's certainly people of, of a you know certain age younger than us that that don't think that way. But, you know, that tends to be the stereotype, at least. Um I'm curious, you mentioned uh, something a few minutes ago. I want to get your your thoughts on it. Don't burn any bridges. I'm curious, have you seen this happen uh, where going, you know, younger students or people, career shifters will, I don't know, act out or do something they probably shouldn't burn the bridge and then not have that resource anymore in the future? Have you seen that happen? Uh, I, I've done that myself early at my okay. career. You know, it's, it's one of those things <laughs> so where I now, it, yeah. <laughs> I now realize these things. I mean, yeah. and that's a, that's, that is one of the advantages of having some miles on the odometer of life Absolutely. experiences that you, you, I can, I can look back on these things and say, boy, I could have handed that, handled that situation better. Uh, I have not necessarily seen, I know just through informal conversation and things like discord through school, there have been some times where people are trying to navigate having their job or hate their job and then doing the schoolwork and stuff. And maybe they decide to go full time and then leave that job. Um, those situations do occur, you know, people being miserable with their job and doing it. But I, I haven't heard of any big blow ups that people have burned bridges in order to to do something like that. I imagine it happens, though. I mean, that's, you know, that's life. Well, one of the things I, I mean, I've seen this a few times is just the way people act or interact, maybe is a better way to say it, interact with other people on something like LinkedIn or social media. Um, and Twitter is maybe a little bit more fleeting. LinkedIn, though, it's very easy to kind of track and see behavior or bad behavior, right, is there. And it's 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 hard to hide a lot of times because, you know, people always go to your LinkedIn posts or LinkedIn feed or LinkedIn profile when you get a job interview, a lot of people put their LinkedIn link on their website, you know, contact me page. It's right there, which actually leads me to one of the things that I would love to highlight that you've been doing that I think is worth sharing with uh, junior designers or career transitioners. And that's been how you've, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on any other thing. I don't know if you're on any of the other social media site. You're shaking your head. You're <laughs> it's like too much for me. But the way that you've linked in is something like I would love to highlight and share because I think you're doing a wonderful job of interacting, of posting your own thoughts. And it seems to me at least like you're using LinkedIn as another tool to show the things that you've learned, right? So you're, you're showing the things that you've learned through interesting posts, interesting feedback, replying to other people and how you interact with other designers or other thought leaders or whomever on LinkedIn. I love that you're doing that. I'm just curious, you got any thoughts? Is that intentional? Are you trying to cultivate that or is that just your personality in general coming out? I'm curious. Well, it, I do believe that link, you know, LinkedIn is a professional uh, uh, platform intended for professional behavior so far as I'm concerned. Sure. Uh, it is one of those things where I am mindful of the posts that I, I create. I try to be respectful of others. I try to be professional in my interactions so that a prospective employer could go there at any time and I don't have to worry about, oh, you know, what did I post at 1 a.m.? You know, that, yeah. sort of, <laughs> that sort of thing. And yeah. uh, so I do believe that it's important to, to maintain, treat, uh, tr treat it as though anybody could take mm -hmm. anything off your LinkedIn profile and publish it elsewhere and that you would be okay with them doing so because mm -hmm. it might happen. You never know. 
Uh, one of the things that I do not use it for, I know that there are people that will post on a daily basis. Um, that is something where I just do not have the mental bandwidth to say something that I feel is is worth posting on a daily basis. <laughs> and I also yeah. really, I, I see the value of things like AI, for sure, no doubt whatsoever. But I do, I can tell maybe when someone has augmented their thoughts with AI, there's kind of a rhythm to it. And I just don't, I, I don't, I just, I read that and I just kind of go, ew, you know, and it's like, I don't want to be a artificial intelligence thought leader, you know, generated thought leader because AI content, AI can make you sound smart. But when you get in a pinch, if you're asked to talk about subject matter expertise, you better be able to talk in the same manner. You know, I'd like, I'd like to think that, <laughs> I'd like yeah. to think that my posts on LinkedIn, if someone were to meet me, my writing would be how I present myself in person speaking with people. So that when people, you know, hopefully when Absolutely. people hear yeah. this and they hear my voice, yeah. they'll be able to go to my LinkedIn and say, oh, that sounds like Kevin. Now, that's something that I feel like a lot of people, young, younger or junior designers or career shifters, people who aren't thought leaders yet, right? They think, I don't have any reason to post on LinkedIn, so I'm not going to. I'm going to lurk. And I, I do this, and I don't know if other people do this. I imagine most people probably do. Now, I'm not a hiring manager, but I give a lot of hiring input, you know, whether or not we should hire someone or not. And when I get a resume or a portfolio coming across my desk, and especially if they have LinkedIn, even if they don't, I will often go and find them and see what they have to say. Now, if they don't have something, I'm not going to hold it against them and say, ah, screw them, pass. But if they do have something, it's a really great way to peek behind the curtains and see some of their thought processes. And, and, and I believe very strongly that LinkedIn is a tool to show off, just like you're saying, if I brought you in an interview... I could be very, fairly certain that the things you're posting are similar to the things you're going to say in the interview, right? So it gives me a really great insight into, into how you think. Again, how you interact with other people. Are you right. nice? Or are you total asshole? You know, like that kind of stuff comes across on LinkedIn. Even if, even you, you know, it's hard to judge emotion from a, from a, a thread, uh, just a, a text thread. But still, you can, you can guess sometimes when someone's being a jerk or not, right? You can be pretty, pretty uh, spot on. So anyway, the, I love that you're doing that and you post, you interact with other people, the thought leaders. Like I, if I'm not mistaken, you've been to some of Darren Hood's chit chat hours and Tony Mora stuff, right? I have not, but I'd wanted to. No, no. Yeah. You wanted to. Okay. Maybe we talked about that. Maybe it was somebody else I'm thinking of, but, but that's the kind of stuff that I feel like, you know, people that are on LinkedIn, that's a really great opportunity to just go and, and meet other people who know what they're talking about and build that filter up that Darren Hood's always talking about and, you know, engage with the community. And I just love that you've been doing that on LinkedIn. I, that's something I just want to highlight and share. Um, I don't know, again, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but if it's, if it's something you're not comfortable doing, again, you know, fear of my wad, my high, but it's paper thin, just get on there and just start interacting with people, comment, follow, like, you never know who you're going to meet. And that was like, I, I do post daily. And one of the things that I have found posting daily was the amount of people I have met through interacting with other people, commenting on my post, someone commenting on something, then that gets in a, getting a comment and then me meeting. This is a, exactly how I met you and nearly every other guest I've ever interviewed on this show, I have met in a very similar way with the exception of people I already knew beforehand. And so I think that's huge. I think using LinkedIn and any other kind of thing is a, just another tool. It's just a great thing to do. And I just want to highlight that you've been doing that. So, you know, that's something... Definitely follow Kevin, see what he's doing, and try to try to do very similar things. Uh, so, anything else before we get out of here, Kevin? You got any other final thoughts? Anything that we didn't get a chance to talk about that you think is worth calling out? Um, two things. One, I think, is that just another lesson I think people should keep in mind is that uh, acknowledge your limitations on time and your your mental health and well being. Ah, yes, um, I think that again that goes with asking for help. Uh, it's important to know that all of this, especially career change, can be very stressful, can stress a lot of aspects of your life. So don't don't see those as failures or, or weaknesses. Uh, just understand what the effect that they're having on you. Uh, and then also, finally, on the point of LinkedIn, I think it's important to never underestimate the fact that people want to work with people who they like and they find agreeable. And that's a, yes. that is that is an X factor <laughs> yes. in all hiring decisions. You know, I'm sure as you yeah. being on hiring panels and things, 
you're you're sitting you're sitting back and there's got to be a part in your mind where you're saying can i see myself working with this person on a daily basis and that is a that is a component where 100%. being active on linkedin uh conversing maybe with people you don't know in real life but doing so in a in a manner that's professional and friendly and all these sorts of things you never know where that's going to take you yeah, absolutely. And when you said burn bridges, that was the first thing I thought of actually, because I've seen so many people interacting with others. Like I'll give you an example, like Dr. Nick Fine, for instance, right? There are people that go on and engage with him uh -huh. and are so mean to him. And sure. sometimes he can be kind of combative back for sure. But when I look at that and I'm like, I don't want to work with you. You're making fun of this guy who's like yeah. a doctor. I, you know, it just, it, it blows my mind that people do that kind of stuff. And you know, I don't know. Anyway, like Dr. Nick's done all kinds of really cool stuff. He's a brilliant guy. He's got a freaking PhD, he's smarter than I could ever be. And you're making fun of him on here. Like I, right. I pass, you know, no way. Well, that's one of the, that's one of the downsides of, uh, in, online is that you do, you know, there are so yeah, many people that will write something trolls, online man. that they would <laughs> never say to a person's face. And, but the same, but the thing is right, that, right, right. you know, that's content that's <laughs> out there. Uh, that other people can see, you know, if you're rude to somebody in a conversation or something, unless it's being recorded or unless there's a very large group of people there, that's something that would then go off into the ether. Whereas if it's something that you're writing on LinkedIn, sure. unless you're conscious enough to delete that content for some reason, uh, it's there for everyone to see. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, that's good. That's actually can be very good Absolutely. if you use it, if you use it correctly. Uh, so people are looking at your LinkedIn profile, whether you realize it or not, mm -hmm. even if you don't have one, they're looking for it. So keep that in mind. All right, Kevin. Awesome, man. Well, we, I've got a few questions I like to ask all my guests to help all the listeners out there get to know my guests a little bit better. Uh, do you have uh, some time to, uh, to talk, uh, to, to answer a few more questions? Yeah, sure. All right, let's do it. What is your favorite non-design book? Ooh, good question. I think about that in terms of like, what is a book that I will reread or revisit? Um, Kurt Vonnegut put out a book uh, probably in the late 60s called Welcome to the Monkey House. And it was a book of short stories of his from earlier mm. in his career when he would write articles and sci-fi stories for uh, publications like the Saturday Evening Post, things like that. And it's a really, really great, I don't know, you know, if somebody is a, is a Kurt Vonnegut fan, uh, if they haven't read it, it's, it's required reading. He has this great, he had this great combination of, uh, cynicism, optimism, uh, sci-fi and, and just being mm -hmm. a clever writer. <laughs> so uh, yeah. if, if someone who hasn't read, uh, the book, welcome to the monkey house, it's, and again, because it's a series of articles, you can just drop in, drop out. It's not something where you're, you can just read a single story and then come back to it later, but it's, it's a really great book. Yeah. Yeah. Kurt Money. That's great. That's a great recommendation. I don't think I've ever heard of that, uh, anthology, that, that book that he's, that when you're, you're talking about, welcome to the monkey house. He's said. Yeah. Cool. I have to check it out. All right. Awesome. All right. What's your favorite non-design podcast? Um, one podcast that I really like, it's called Reconcilable Differences. It's, uh, it's a hmm. podcast. There are, uh, there's, there are multiple podcasts that I listen to and I, I really listen to a lot of podcasts where I like the hosts and it's maybe not even necessarily yeah. the subject matter. It's about the personalities. So the two hosts of the program, uh, one is Merlin Mann who, uh, has other, has other podcasts, but he is, you know, known in the tech and productivity uh, 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 industry. And then also, uh, the other host is John Syracuse, who has a long history of doing things related with the Mac. And they started this podcast some years back. And, th and the whole premise of the podcast was them getting to know each other better. So, oh, and, I love it. Yeah. and so <laughs> they were two people, they had a profile, they knew each other, but they didn't know each other in a personal way. So, uh, -huh. uh it's called reconcilable differences. I would recommend that people go back to something like episode two, when they are just getting to know each other and get that dynamic. Oh, and, then, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, you can fast forward to the way it is now and they're up over 200 episodes. And it's, it's, it's really, really interesting to see the dynamic of two people getting to know each other in real time while it's being recorded. And it's, it's really great. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that concept. I, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm weird, but I always go back to like the first episode and start podcasts at the very beginning. I don't know if I'm like, 
I don't know if a lot of people do that or not, but um, yeah, I don't it's, know. it's it I'm is one of those things where I've heard multiple <laughs> podcast hosts say that it takes a few to, for uh, to establish a rhythm, and you know, yeah, so yeah. but but yes, I I agree with that. I think it's if it's a if it's something that's not time sensitive, if it's just subject matter, mm-hmm. I, it's really nice to right. go back and take a take a look at some of the yeah, early work. Yeah, I love that. All right, I have to check that out. I haven't heard of it before. What is your favorite meal? And this could be something that you've cooked, something you've gone on a, you, you've eaten at a restaurant. It could be something your mom, or your grandma used to cook. Mm. Favorite meal? I, it's going to sound horrible to some probably, but uh, I would say that a bacon cheeseburger with onion rings is one of those meals Ooh, yeah, there that you go. <laughs> um, I don't have very often, uh, but I yeah. do love it. Uh, and I know that I should, I should be, you know, I should be going on to having the fake bacon and, and, and (laughs) plant-based patties and things like that. Uh, but I'm not there yet. So yeah, that would be my, that would be what I'd really say. Where, where's your favorite bacon cheeseburger? Oh man. Cook it at home or you got there? Uh, I think the best ones that I've ever had, I mean, I will grill, I grill a lot and I will make them at home. I think that the best place that I've ever had them as at uh Dogfish Head Brewery in Rehoboth Ooh, Beach. Okay. They have a restaurant there and they have an amazing, amazing one. Oh, all right. I'll put it on my bucket yeah. list. Now let me ask you this. This is we're we're going off script yeah. a little bit. Do you like the big fat grilled burgers versus the small thinner uh smash big burgers? Fat. Big fat medium you rare. Like big fat. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Ooh. All right. Yeah. See, I could go either way. I, I like both for different okay. reasons. You know, I like, uh, I like the big fat grilled medium rare burger, um, when I can barely fit it on my mouth and yeah. the juice is dripping mm-hmm. down my arms and everything else, you know, but, um, then I also love just a little, you know, thin little patty with the, you know, the, the mired reaction with the brown kind of real seared, real good with the melted cheese and the, you know, the kind of hamburger sauce going in there. It's with a lot you know, different, yeah. different times. Uh, but yeah, I love, I love it. Okay. I love that, man. Ooh, you got me hungry. <laughs> I want a cheeseburger. Uh, all right. What's your favorite vacation spot? Um, I would say that I am more of a beach person. I love going down mm. to the Caribbean. Uh, it's been too long since I've been down there, but I have found my vacation, uh, experiences tend to gravitate more towards I'm completely exhausted uh, I would just want to get away and sit in a chair <laughs> and stare at the water. Yeah. So I would say it would definitely be a, a beach somewhere in the Caribbean. Oh, I love that, man. Do you have kids by any chance? Or they, I do not. You don't not. have kids. Oh man. Okay. So I got two kids, five and seven. And like, I used to, I used to love going to the beach and now going to the beach is just so much work with all the crap you gotta, you know, you gotta bring all the stuff and then all the snacks and all the food and the, you know, all the chairs and the toys. And then, not, and then once you get there, they're just running off and they're, you know, you can't leave a five-year-old to run around by themselves on the beach. So it's like, it's just so much effort and work. It's like, now I just kind of want to like stay at home. I didn't want to go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the sunburn like, and everything yeah, like and that. Yeah. And then the sunburn, which is even worse. Yeah. I got a friend who's got kids. He's like eight, they're 18 or teenagers or in their twenties. And and he was like, oh, I used to hate the beach. He's like, now I love the beach. Favorite, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I just go and sit right. on the beach. I don't have to do anything. Nobody, yeah. nobody bothers me. I just sit on the chair for hours and yeah. we're, we're re-apply. about 45 minutes from the ocean. So oh, nice. where do you live? Get there pretty quick. I'm in Salisbury, Maryland. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. man. We used to so. live in New Orleans and we were about four hours from the panhandle in Florida. And it was you know, uh. some of the most beautiful beaches in the world in, in Florida, Destin and, and Rosemary Beach area, 30A and all that stuff. And now we're like 13 or 14 hour drive. You know, so it's so hard. And, yeah. you know, and now with the kids, it's not worth it. I'm just like, you know what? Let's just go camping. That's a lot easier. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's your favorite design tool that is not Figma? I would probably go back into my architecture days and say SketchUp. Uh, SketchUp, SketchUp oh, yeah. is a 3D modeling tool that's a really, really accessible tool for people to learn. Uh, and you can make anything you want in it, really. Uh, so yeah, you can do quick visualization. You can make movies of your, of, of, you know, do walkthroughs and walkarounds and things. Uh, it's file format can be exported to a variety of tools, uh, and including, including, um, VR. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so it's, I'd say it's, it's 
definitely one of my favorites. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I, I, I didn't realize SketchUp did all that. I, mean, I used to play around with it back in the day when it first came out and, yeah, you yeah. know, I didn't have much use for it being a, a graphic designer at the time. But uh, yeah, that's really cool. I love that. All right, man. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for, for joining today. I really appreciate it. Before we get out of here, we, we talked a lot about you being on LinkedIn. Let, tell us where, where can we find you? Um, we'll put your LinkedIn in the show notes. You want it anywhere else? You got a website or anything else you want to promote? I do have a website. It would be kevinshirts.com. Uh, I do have my portfolio on there with case studies. And uh, yeah, I'd love for I'd love for people to check it out and always, always love to get feedback on my work. Right on. And uh, you're finishing up your boot camp. And so you will be looking for a job. And I don't know when we post this, maybe uh, if you don't already have a job when this uh, is released, give Kevin a holler. And that's Kevin Shirts, S-H-E-R-T-Z. Uh, so, you know, homonyms and stuff sounds like shirts, but, um, yeah, so check out kevinshirts.com and, uh, we'll, we'll post a link to the show in the show notes to your website and your LinkedIn and everything. Uh, but I really appreciate you sharing all your insights, all your valuable insights. And I think, uh, I think this conversation is going to help out a lot of folks that are, you know, looking to, to maybe join a boot camp, school, whatever, self-taught, whatever. And um, I think I think it's going to help them out quite a bit. So thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, all right, y'all. That's it for Kevin and me for today. I hope we helped give a little bit of insight into one man's journey from architecture into UX design and what he went through, going through his boot camp, and how he ultimately got as much value as he could out of his program. But I'm curious, anybody out there who has gone to a boot camp had a similar experience to Kevin. I'd love to hear from you. You had a different experience from Kevin. I'd also love to hear from you. Let me know what you think on LinkedIn or shoot me an email at hello at beyonduxdesign.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you like what you heard today, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you feel like you're getting something out of the show, then I would love it if you left a five-star review. That would help me out so much more than you can imagine. And if you know anybody who might find any of this stuff useful, why don't you tell them about it? If you want to help keep the show independent and ad-free, check out all the Patreon sponsorship packages at beyonduxdesign.com slash support. You can join Chris, Siroquan, Stacy, Radu, Megan, Andrew, John, Mark, and Kevin by supporting the show for as little as $3 a month. And there are some awesome perks like that badass holographic Beyond UX Design sticker. You can get a shout on the show every week. There's even a package to meet with me for 30 minutes every month. Make sure to check out figmaacademy.com and use the promo code BEYONDUX at checkout to get $100 off any of their Figma courses. Join over 4,000 designers from industry leaders like Shopify, Microsoft, and Amazon that have already signed up. Head on over to Figma Academy, use BEYONDUX at checkout, and kickstart your Figma mastery journey today. Don't forget to head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash audible trial to download the science of self-learning, how to teach yourself anything, learn more in less time, and direct your own education by Peter Hollins. Sign up for a free 30-day audible trial, cancel at any time, and the book is yours to keep forever. And in case you forgot, I've partnered with audible.com, so anytime you sign up for a free trial, you'll help support the show. There's no obligation. You can cancel any time, and the audiobook is yours to keep forever. So get a free audiobook on me and help support the show. Remember to sign up for the newsletter and check out all the past episodes along with all the show notes at beyonduxdesign.com. I hope you keep coming back for more great UX tips from Beyond UX Design. And until next time, remember, you're more than a designer because there's more to UX and design. I'll see you around. Take care, y'all. Um, well, at the end, it's going to sound good. We'll fix it in post. Okay. Make me sound smart. Yeah, you sound real smart. <laughs>